My name is Eduardo Barbosa. Welcome to this Chastity Appearance of COVID-19 webinar. My objectives are to briefly discuss what is known about COVID-19 pathogenesis and clinical course, emphasizing implications to its known imaging manifestations, to describe the range of chastity appearance of COVID-19, to present suspected and confirmed COVID-19 patients demonstrating the range of CT appearances, differential diagnostic considerations, as well as the disease temporal evolution. Pathogenesis and clinical course. The novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, which is the cause of COVID-19, uses widely expressed angiotensin converge enzyme type 2 receptors to enter human cells. These include pneumocytes, respiratory, renal, gastrointestinal epithelium, as well as vascular endothelium. The virus enters the nasal and oropharyngeal mucosa, causes a wide viremia that allows it to seed multiple tissues and organs in the body. That explains many of the imaging presentations. There's a wide spectrum of disease severity. 80% of patients are mild, 50% have a more severe, and 5% have a critical clinical course. The time from symptom onset to potential dyspnea requiring hospital admission is from 7 to 10 days. Risk factors of severe and critical presentations include older age, comorbidities, and immunocompromised status. Pneumonia is the hallmark of severe and critical presentations. ARDS, which may be accompanied by cytokine release syndrome, is common in critical presentations, and it is one of the most important causes of mortality. Diagnosis of COVID-19 Definitive diagnosis requires a positive reverse transcription PCR test for the virus SARS-CoV-2 utilizing a nasopharyngeal swab specimen Testing for other respiratory pathogens is also advised when available. This may include adenovirus and influenza. A positive PCR is generally confirmatory. It has a very high positive predictive value for COVID-19. Nonetheless, a negative PCR can be a false negative in 20 to 50% of patients, therefore in high pre-test probability and high level of clinical suspicion, serial sampling may be needed. Negative chest imaging does not exclude infection of SARS-CoV-2, especially if images obtained early on the disease clinical course. That's very important to emphasize. Chest radiograph is the primary imaging modality, though findings are not specific. CT is reserved for complex situations and problem solving, including to assess differential diagnosis, contributory factors, and reasons to explain clinical deterioration. The Fleischian Society has published a special report in radiology on April 2020, in which they suggest that imaging is not routinely indicated in suspected COVID-19 with mild symptoms. However, imaging is indicated in a patient with COVID-19 and worsening respiratory status. Finally, they conclude that in a resource-constrained environment, for example, if there's lack of PCR testing capability, imaging is indicated for medical triage of patients with suspected COVID-19 who present with modern or severe clinical features and a high pretest probability of this disease. What is the CT appearance of COVID-19? Typical patterns include acute ground glass opacities, with or without consolidations, with or without intralobular and interlobular septal thickening. The distribution matters. A typical distribution is bilateral, multifocal, and oftentimes peripheral predominant. When should one consider differential diagnosis? 
whenever you have CT findings that are not typical for COVID-19. And here's the list. Any chronic findings, especially findings that have been present and are known to be stable for at least a month. Well-defined solid nodules and masses. These have not been described in association with COVID-19. Bronchiolitis, and that's different from other respiratory viruses. Focal dense consolidation, much more likely to represent bacterial infections. Diffuse ground glass opacities with peribronchovascular distribution, a pattern that's more likely to be related to pulmonary edema. Fibrotic features, such as honeycombing, traction bronchiectasis, which are seen in the setting of interstitial lung diseases. It's also important to realize that in any given patient, findings that are potentially related to COVID-19 may coexist with findings that are likely unrelated to COVID-19. What is the role of CT in diagnosis and management of COVID-19? No CT findings can definitively confirm or exclude COVID-19. CT sensitivity is high, 88 to 97%, based on published literature, but it has low specificity, as low as 25%. Therefore, to maximize utility of CT in the evaluation of COVID-19, one needs to assess, first, what's the clinical context? For example, what are the patient's symptoms? The, when did the symptoms start? And what's the relationship of the date of imaging with the date of symptom onset? Are there any alternative explanations, any comorbidities that it's important to take into consideration? What's the pretest probability? And that depends on the current prevalence of COVID-19 in the location where you're practicing. And lastly, whether such findings are acute, which requires comparison to prior imaging, if available, that's very useful. I will present several cases of confirmed or suspected COVID-19 to demonstrate the range of imaging appearance. I will start with this patient who is a 52-year-old male, presents to the hospital, day number two of fever and dry cough. He had a chest radiograph performed, PA and lateral, which was normal, no abnormalities. Because of the clinical suspicion, he was tested. The PCR came back positive for COVID-19, and given that he had mild clinical presentation and normal imaging, he was sent home for self-quarantine. This patient came back to the hospital on day number six because of worsening dyspnea. At that time, he was admitted and a chest CT without contrast was performed. The video of the axial acquisition basically shows multiple ground glass opacities rounded and peripheral, involving both lungs with a basilar zonal predominance. On day 14, this patient was in the ICU, this time with ARGS, and the CT performed that day shows substantial worsening of extensive, more confluent ground glass opacities and consolidations. This is a classic typical presentation of COVID-19 pneumonia. Case number two is a 66-year-old male with COPG, day number seven of low-grade fever and dyspnea, comes to the hospital, a CT of the chest was performed, and the chest CT shows not only underlying emphysema, paraceptum centrolobular, but also extensive multifocal confluent ground glass opacities, bilaterally. This is another pattern that can be seen with COVID-19 associated pneumonia. This patient was tested and the PCR came back positive for COVID-19, confirming the diagnosis. Case number three is a 54-year-old male who is immunocompromised because he is status post bilateral lung transplantation. We had access to a baseline chest CT performed several months before his presentation that shows areas of subpleural scarring in both lower lobes, but no airspace disease at that time, which means no consolidation and no ground glass opacities. He comes to the hospital on day number six 
with respiratory symptoms, dry cough, dyspnea, and fever. A new chest CT is performed, and at that time, we see new areas of ground glass opacity, small, multifocal, superimposed on previously seen pleuroparenchymal scarring, and those are highlighted here. The patient's tested, the test results for COVID-19 PCR come back positive on day 8, the patient is admitted to the hospital. After several days in the hospital, the patient develops ARGS. On day number 22, the patient is intubated, and that's the chest CT that was performed at that time that shows that the ground glass opacities are now much more extensive and confluent and involve both lungs. So that's an evolution of COVID-19 from early ground glass opacities, mild, to extensive airspace disease in a pattern that is indistinguishable from diffuse alveolar damage in a patient who has ARGS. Case number four, 45 year old male with a history of lymphoma, active, had a baseline chest CT performed three months ago. The baseline chest CT demonstrates no lung abnormalities. Comes to the hospital, day number nine of fever and respiratory symptoms. This chest CT is performed that demonstrates new patish multifocal peripheral predominant areas of consolidation highlighted here. This is another presentation of COVID-19 pneumonia. This patient tested positive with PCR. Case number five is a 77 year old male presents with day number nine of fever plus respiratory symptoms, including worsening dyspnea. A chastity with contrast is performed to assess for pulmonary embolism. And we can see that the patient has positive pulmonary emboli in the right upper lobe, segmental arteries, also in the right lower lobe, segmental arteries, demonstrated by the arrows. However, the lung parenchyma demonstrates extensive multifocal airspace disease comprised by areas of consolidation and ground glass, which are peripheral predominant, bilateral. This patient was tested and the test results came back positive for COVID-19, in addition to positive pulmonary embolism. This is a topic of ongoing research, but there seems to be an association between COVID-19 and increased risk of developing pulmonary embolism. Case number six is a 47-year-old female with metastatic breast cancer. She had a baseline CT performed as part of her treatment protocol one month ago that demonstrates multiple well-circumscribed solid nodules. Those were metastatic lesions. She comes to the hospital, day number three of cough, fever, and worsening dyspnea. A new chest CT is performed which again demonstrates the metastatic lesions that have actually progressed in the interval. However, there are new, ill-defined central lobular nodules, many of them with twin bud configuration, as well as faint areas of ground glass opacification. These are highlighted here. The patient was tested for COVID-19. The PCR results came back negative. However, a respiratory viral panel was also obtained and this was positive for rhinovirus. In addition, there was also an incidental finding of pulmonary embolism that you can see highlighted here in the right interlobal artery. So there's another situation in which COVID-19 was suspected. However, an alternative diagnosis, which is a combination of two acute conditions, pulmonary embolism and another viral infection by rhinovirus explain the clinical presentation in a patient who has underlying metastatic breast cancer. The last case, case number seven, is a 53-year-old male. He presented in the hospital with fever and cough on day number seven. A chest radiograph was performed that demonstrates a dense consolidation in the left mid-lung zone. A CT done in the same day confirms that dense consolidation focal in the left upper lobe and no other pulmonary abnormality. This pattern is statistically more likely a bacterial infection. The patient was tested 
in the test results confirmed that the patient was negative for COVID-19 by PCR. There was a negative respiratory viral panel, but the patient tested positive for streptococcus pneumonia. The patient was treated with antibiotics, sent home, and returned to the hospital for a follow-up approximately four weeks later that demonstrates complete resolution of the consolidation. So that's an alternative diagnosis to COVID-19, a bacterial pneumonia. In conclusion, in the proper clinical setting, which entails a high pretest probability, typical chest CT findings are sensitive and can be moderately specific for diagnosis of COVID-19 associated pneumonia. Chest CT is helpful to assess differential diagnosis and therefore can explain factors contributing to the clinical presentation. Chastity guides management in complex scenarios and may help to explain why the patient is deteriorating clinically. Chastity may have a role in prognostication. There are some initial publications suggesting semi-quantitative CT scores are one of many predictors of mortality. And finally, CT value may be augmented via quantitative artificial intelligence algorithms, particularly for prognostication, helping with medical decision making. Thank you for your attention. I hope this was useful and you'll be helpful in your clinical practice.